All right, everybody. Let's see what's going on. Good morning to you. Let's see if we have uh, some audio. I think we do. Or are you audio? There you go. Yep, audio is on. Okay. So let's see what's going on here. Um, we're going to go over to our table of contents. And I think, okay, to remind you guys, we're looking at this some of these worksheets, okay, some of these notes, um, the uniform distribution, just to kind of illustrate to you what we went through briefly yesterday on the uniform distribution uh, is the following. Um, rolling a die, ladies and gentlemen. As you guys can see, we, we've seen this. Rolling a die um, for every outcome, for every number gives you what's called a uniform distribution. Now this is, uh, we did a lot of rows. We did approximately 2,500, 2,600 rows yesterday. Um, and we actually seen the actual, what mean and standard deviation for this. So, okay. So I said to you guys, okay, this is what we kind of went through. And then um, I did try to format this. It really drives me crazy when we try to format and it doesn't really come out. It's going to come out right now in a few seconds. We go back to the internet. Um, but I do have it on the iPad as well. So maybe we'll look at it there instead as it downloads. Um, let's kind of talk a little bit about this. Okay. This is what I wanted to make sure uh, yesterday. Uh, we see that this is the mean and standard deviation here for a uniform distribution. Okay, so even though we, we talk about the uniform distribution, we didn't really see an example of it. And it's a fundamental distribution. Uh, flipping coins, you know, heads or tails, you could do that same, same kind of um, experiment that we did here, same kind of simulation. What I did was a simulation. Um... And then this is kind of weird. Oh no, it's not weird. I did I did fix it. Okay. So here's a uniform distribution uh, again. And then we went through looking at, I wanted you guys to read this, what's called the sample distribution of the means. In other words, we have this random variable here. Um, and this is gonna be a foundational kind of thing. This is a big X, and it's a distribution of the means. We wrote that down yesterday. And it's essentially a distribution of the sample means, right? So we have this little X bar. So you got all those sample means. And so we went through as well a simulation, and then... I'm going through the simulation here again, and then we also have the distribution of the sample variances, by the way, but okay. So, you know, this is in the notes. Essentially, we're taking a sample size of 40, and we're doing multiple experiments of this. This is 10 samples. So we did this 10 times, and all I'm saying is take a look at the detail of this, right? If I can get this. So just kind of going through those notes. Notice I kept track of the mean and the variance, right? These values. So we have all these values of the sample means, different sample means for different experiments, as you guys can see. Different variance values as well, okay? So I should have 10 of these because I went through 10 experiments. And then the real question is, what kind of distribution do you get for both the sample means and the sample variances. And this is gonna be a foundational kind of idea, uh, just so that you guys know. We're, we're heading into this concept called estimation. Um, and it's based on these simulations, really. Okay, the distribution of sample means. And we did this again now. You said, okay, uh, what does that data look like? You're like, ah, if I look at the data, it doesn't really look like any sort of distribution with 10 simulations, you know, you go, oh, that doesn't really look like anything. All right. Um, so then you said, okay, what happens if I have a, 
uh, 25 now, right? If we go through 25 of these experiments with the sample size, still 40, you know, same sample size again, but let's do this now 25 times, right? And let's take a look at now again, all the different what sample means and the different variances for all 25 of those same size experiments, you know? So you're gathering all these values for the mean and for the variance. And then you say, well, let's see what that distribution looks like. And then you go, okay, what does that distribution lo look like, right? Now you start to see, well, maybe it's kind of normal, right? It looks like it's normal. Uh, and this is just for the sample means. I didn't even, I think I might have the, the variances as well. But anyway, um, so what we're saying is we start to see a distribution that approximates a normal distribution. And I even computed the mean for that. It should be somewhere, yeah. So even computing the mean of the means for all of those values, it's right over here. Um, I'm gonna emphasize, there's the mean and here's the standard deviation of all of these values that we got here just by repeating the experiment just 25 times, you know, of the same sample size. And so we're starting to see, ladies and gentlemen, that, okay, the mean here of that distribution and the standard deviation, I'm notating as well. That's an important detail. So we're starting to see just after 25 of those experiments that maybe the distribution's normal. And then you said, okay, did I go crazy? Yes, I did. I did 40, sample size of 40 here. I did this random sample 100 times, this process. And again, I gathered all the, the means and the what variance values for this, okay? They're all down here in those notes, just so you guys can see. Um, and then I took again, plotted that distribution for just the means. It, it didn't have the var uh, the variances. Um, and then, ladies and gentlemen, we find again, the distribution is starting to look what? Normal, most of the data is in the center. And the mean here, standard deviation, ladies and gentlemen, through this simulation, is about 3.499, standard deviation is 0 0.250, okay. So that was with 100 of those processes. So this is, this is interesting, okay? And I summarized it right here as well. So, so far so good with the idea. We're just repeating the experiment over and over again with the exact same sample size and then focusing on the mean and really the variance, although I didn't put the data there. Uh, if I wrote this all over again, I might do it differently and do that as well. And I might one day, kicking that around, the simulation idea, kicking around some ideas. And then I went really crazy. How many times did we do this process again? 500 times, you see that? So I did this 500 times, same sample size, gathered all of the mean and variance values. Okay, you guys see what I'm saying? Notice they're all slightly different, aren't they? These are the mean and variance values. They're slightly different right in here. Gathered that piece of information. So if you guys can see that 3.6, 3.4, 3.55. So we're gonna see how those mean and variances are distributed. And okay. And as you guys can start to see, and it even looks like, well, I think your distribution looked a little bit more normal in the past. You might be right. But notice again, what's going on here is that we got the mean and variance of all of those data values that we had up here, right? So we're just going through the simulation of what happens. And then I think, and then again, I summarized it here. It's gonna be there for a reason. Um, and then I think I did it, what, uh, oh yeah, here's what I did. I kept the 500, I increased the sample size. Um, I could have went through a thousand rows or, you know, simulations or 2,500 simulations, you know, same sample size. That would have been fine, but I just increased the sample size here of a hundred. And then again, you're getting the, the mean and the variance values. And we're gonna now see this distribution. It just turns out the bigger the sample and the greater the number of simulations, 
the more beautiful your normal distribution is. And so we were just repeating that process a larger number of times, which is the point. And then you start to see again, ah, you know, we're getting that mean and that standard deviation. So the mean of that distribution and standard deviation is what you guys see here. I'm still summarizing it there. So I'm just going through this simulation with you guys that I wrote a couple of years ago for this uh, workbook. And then you might have said, okay, Mr. Judge, what did you do now? Well, I did a Poisson distribution. Um, same kind of simulation. It's not that important. You guys can read about it. I think to summarize this, um, you know, Poisson essentially, you know, this is the distribution of it. It's not normal. Um, and then how many times did we do it here? 10, 10 times sample size 40 again. I think I did 40 because I can fit it there. And then uh, distribution of the means again. So the whole point that I want to make for you guys here is really this. Um, it's going to start to look like what curve? The bell-shaped curve going through the simulations. Uh, I kept track of the mean. I kept track of the standard deviation for this distribution, okay? I did 500 random samples of size 40. And again, the point is for you that the distribution of the means is gonna look normal. And um, I kept track of the mean and the variance as well here. So just gonna go through that. And then we did, uh, what did we do here? 50? Samples, oh, sample size 100. I increased the sample size to 100 with 50 simulations. And again, kept track of the mean and the variances. Ooh, and then you should see again, the distribution looks about normal. And it's around the mean of four. Um, okay, standard deviation of 0.94. 100, sample size 500. Increase that sample size. It's going to give you a, a nicer, more... Uh, normal distribution, we're starting to see that, but it's only a hundred simulations. That's kind of small. Did I go even further? Kept track of the mean and the standard deviation. Did I go track? Oh, now I finally looked at the variance and said, hey, you guys, look at the variance. The, the variance is, and you might be able to see that this is not normal. Okay. You're starting to see that that distribution is not normal and it isn't. This is a sample distribution of the variances now. The values that we get for variance through these random samples, sample size of 100. Um, so I did, oh, it's right skew. Yeah, most of the data is on the left. So I'm trying to show you guys that idea through simulations. It appears right skewed. And then here's what I did, ironically. I, I took a normal distribution uh, like the IQ distribution with a mean of 100 standard deviation. We know that. So we, 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 it's like if I said to you guys for homework for all 40 students, I said, okay, all you guys, did you guys take that IQ test yesterday? Any geniuses, any Mensa members in the room? No, did you guys take it? Nobody took that IQ test? Oh, uh, we got to take it together then. Maybe we'll do that. <laughs> Oh, maybe we'll do that. So, ladies and gentlemen, so is it, you know, this is what I'm saying with the simulation. See these data values. This is this is a normal distribution, but the data values, somebody got 100.45, 84. Ah, we could have even approximated those two whole numbers. But anyway. Um, and then we said, okay, here's the mean, 98.79, standard deviation 15.69. This is if we took a sample of people's data scores in class. Uh, I should have done this. Um, I'm getting all these ideas. I might have my weekend uh, full with what I want to do with simulations. I want to do another simulation thing. Mm. Anyway, because I really don't like the green. I really don't like the histogram that I have there. It's like, ugh. you know, so maybe I want to. Convert that to whole numbers because those are IQ scores and then use Desmos and do a beautiful histogram and show you guys that way. So I might want to do that. Anyway, here's my point. This is one sample size 40. I got the mean and I got the variance. And yes, I got the standard deviation. Notice it's not exactly 100 and it's not exactly 15. But, you know, if you took a sample, that's what you would see. So 
if we increase the sample size, you know, you'll get probably closer to 100 and closer to 15. Um, let's see, what did I do in the simulation? Oh, yeah, I looked at the distribution. So we started with a normal distribution, and then I looked at the sample. I looked at these data values. You go, yeah, it is. It is what we thought. It's a normal distribution. Okay. So we, we plotted that. Um, and then, yeah, okay, we already know that. We looked at that. And then I did this how many times? Uh, let's simulate 10. So I did a, I did this process 10 times, okay? Like if I took 10 classes or something. Um, and we, we looked at, again, the details of the mean here, the different means, the different standard deviations. Notice the differences, right? So, you know, you got all these means for the different simulations. They got all these standard deviations. Notice they're around 115. Um, so if I simulated this again, and then I want to look at the distribution of the means and probably the, you know, standard deviation or variance. And you're saying, okay, that kind of looks normal. Yeah. Uh, what, was the, what was the mean there? The mean's about 99.3. 0, 02 and the standard deviation is about 3.070 for the distribution of the means. Okay, we got the standard deviation values as well. And so what did I do? I did a hundred simulations now. Sample size 40 and got all those mean values. You guys can see them here. All the standard deviations as well, and the variance values, all those things, okay? This is the simulation sheet I said you guys want to read. And then if we plot that, those means, ah, we start to see the distribution starts to look normal. Yes. Uh, and then I summarize the, the mean of the means and the standard deviation of the means. And you go, oh, okay. So you're starting to see it's about 100. And Sigma's not 15, though. And then I did the simulation how many times? 500 simulations, same sample size, 40. Looked at the means and, and all those values, of standard deviation and variance values. And as you guys can see, they're all a little bit different. But let's plot them as a histogram. And you know what? It looks normal. And I kept track of the mean of the means and the standard deviation of those means. And you're like, okay, there's going to be a reason. We're going to do this for a reason. So let's simulate now a thousand samples and I increase the sample size. So I said, okay, let's do this a thousand times, sample size of a hundred, same sample size. And we got the means, variance, and standard deviation. Then I plotted them and said, oh, guess what? The means are what? The distribution looks normal. And I kept track of the mean of the means, which is about 100. Standard deviation is about 1.491 for the means um, and the standard deviation of the means. So, and then I said, okay, by the way, let's look at the variance. And as you guys can see, that's not normal. It's going to be, again, right skewed. So if I just looked at the variance values and plotted those, it's not normal, it's right skewed. And it appears to be right skewed, and that's my point. And then I did the same thing with a proportion here. So I'm looking at various distributions, uniform, Poisson, normal, and now a um, proportion where really 65, it's a simulation, 65% uh, will vote for candidate A, that means 35% will vote for candidate B. There's two candidates will simulate the votes. So what I did here was I went through a simulation of voting. How would you vote? And I looked at 40 votes. So the sample size is 40. And then, you know, um, I think zero means vote for A. One means vote for B. So we took these random numbers between zero and one. Uh, 10 simulations. And we took we looked at the proportions now. The sample proportions, ladies and gentlemen. So what's different about this is these are all what's known as sample proportions, okay? So here you go, okay, here's the deal, sample proportions. Um, let's make them orange, maybe. So 
you know, the first simulation, 55% of the voters are going to vote for candidate A. The second simulation, 75%, and then 55, and then 72.5. So these are all sample proportions for these simulations. And if we look at the distribution of sample proportions, it doesn't look so interesting yet. Yes, we have a mean of those values, and we have a standard deviation of those values. So I'm going through what I, I asked you guys to read here, and I'm keeping track of the mean and the standard deviation for sample proportions. Um, and then I did the process 50 times, 50 simulations, kept track of the sample proportions, and I should have put, yeah, there's a sample proportions, okay? Um, distribution of sample proportions is a format issue again. So there you go. And you go, that doesn't really look so exciting. Yeah, I know. Not so exciting. I kept track of the mean and standard deviation. I think I'm going to have to do some more simulations. So I did 100 simulations of 40 votes. Kept track of the sample proportions. And started to simulate, ladies and gentlemen, the distribution. It kind of looks maybe a little normal. Kept track of the mean and the standard deviation for those things. And now I went to 100 simulations with sample size 100. Increasing your sample size is always a good thing. And then if we keep track of those again, sample proportions, okay, 72%, 60%, and so on. And we're going to take the average or the mean and standard deviation of those, and we're going to plot that distribution. You start to see, well, maybe it's going to look normal. And we did keep track of the mean and the standard deviation for those sample proportions. And then I did 500 simulations of sample size 40 to see what that looks like. Kept track again of the sample proportions. Okay. Um, those values. And then, ladies and gentlemen, let's see what happens here. It's starting to look normal. So the more simulations we do... The more simulations we do, and then notice what the mean is. The mean's about 0.648. So I want to share with you guys here, remember, the mean uh, looks like it's around here, 65%. And I guess I have to move that because it's really around here. That's what they're saying here with this, right? We got the mean, and of course, we got the standard deviation of those sample proportions. Wow. So, ladies and gentlemen, just keeping track of that information as well. This is going to be an extremely important detail for us, too. Okay? Keeping track of that, those two numbers. Now, I did a 1,000 simulations, sample size 40, because I want to keep it on the paper there. A 1,000 simulations again had all those sample proportions, okay? And let's see what happened, ladies and gentlemen. The distribution of sample proportions is starting to look normal. And then notice again, you have the mean here, ladies and gentlemen, right over here with a standard deviation of the sample proportions, and it's starting to look normal. And that's amazing here, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Kept track of that information again. This is going to be an important piece of information. Um, all right, what did I do now? A thousand, again, now with the sample size of 100. A thousand simulations, sample size 100. Here's the sheet. Taking a look at all the sample proportions down there for a thousand simulations of this process. And then you go, okay, what does that look like? I would definitely say the data looks normal. Take a look at the mean. Take a look at the what? Standard deviation of those values. It's about 65%. Standard deviation is 0 0.045. So that looks very much what? Normal, right? Anyway. So kept track of the information. Here's your conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the conclusion of this. Kept track of the... This is going to be used for us. We're going to use this information in the future, but I'm just documenting it in our simulation. So here's the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. Where there are, 
original distribution was what? Uniform or skewed in some way, the Poisson distribution. Or whether it was even normal to start with, right? We see the same outcome when we simulate the what? Sample distribution of the means. This is going to be a big deal. Okay. And the sample distribution of the variance. So all I did was, okay, let's take all the mean values, you know, and, and find the mean of the means and the variance, value, the variance of the means. Sample distribution, right? This, this is the symbol for it right here. Um, take a large number of samples of size N with the same population and compute the sample means for those populations. These were all those sample means. Create the relative frequency distribution of the sample means. And what you'll see is this. A normal distribution where what? Where that mean is the same as the original mean or the mean mu. And that is the idea of the distribution. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's a big deal. We're going to be using this information in a meaningful way. Um... And the same thing happened with the proportions. We now computed all those proportions. This is a big deal, too. Um, the sample proportion, this is what they were. You created the distribution, and it turned out to be normal, where the mean of that was the original proportion P. And that goes right in the middle down there. So this is what we've seen here in that simulation notes. And then I put as a note here, hey, notice the distribution of the variances. You took the variances. This is your sample variances. You created that relative frequency table, and the distribution is right skewed. It's not even normal. So this is the documentation of that oh, workbook on sampling distributions. Yeah, the format seems to be still weird. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I wanted you guys to read. So well, all I'm saying is this very fundamental, powerful idea is this. You can take a sample and do it again an arbitrarily large number of times. You know, we only did the, the simulation up to like 2,000 times, 2,500, 2,600, like yesterday. So you could take the same simulation. You know, that's really not large enough what do we say we let n go to infinity you know or not n but we're going to say let the process be an arbitrary large number of times sample size is um you know it could be large but anyway the point i'm making is the sample distribution of the means will be normal and the sample distribution of the variance will be right skewed this is a, a foundational idea that you're going to see it's a very foundational idea we're going to put it in practice now you might say, what, what, is, what does it really mean in practice? Well, I even have, and I don't have anything to drink, do I? My coffee was ahead of me. I had coffee. I'm not a man's cup of coffee. Yeah, I don't have any coffee. I gotta probably go get some more coffee. Anyway, central limit theorem, ladies and gentlemen. This is what this theorem is, okay? This is based on your simulations. Anyway. All right. Let's put some of this information together as a summary. Uh, we discover the simulation of the sample distributions to be clear. The sample distribution of sample means tends to be normal. Really, if the sample size is large enough, right? You're starting to take larger number of sample sizes, the better. Even when the original distribution is not normal, like uniform or, you know, like we've seen not skewed, even if it's not normal, the process, the procedure and concepts discussed here present the foundation of some applications, very meaningful applications in statistics. And that's where we're headed. Anyway, um, when selecting... A random sample from a population, any distribution with a mean mu, standard deviation sigma, we need to understand these principles. Um, n bigger than 30 
is considered what we call a large sample, so you guys know. Uh, the sample means are approximate by a normal distribution where the mean is mu and the standard deviation. Now, I didn't demonstrate this to you guys, but all those standard deviations, okay, I didn't keep track of that, but I'm, I'm, I'm expressing this to you guys now, that the mean of that distribution is mu. It's the same as the mean of the original distribution, and the standard deviation changes by that factor of dividing by the square root of n for any distribution. Now, I didn't keep track of those numbers. I think if I were how to sit down and write this all over again, I think I would. I'd give a little bit more detail to simulation in that way. I'd keep track of that, that mean very, very clearly. And you, you may not have noticed, but the standard deviation of that was a different value. But this is very meaningful for our central limit theorem. So this is really what we're saying in the summary of the central limit theorem, that the mean of that distribution is mu, the original mean for your distribution, but the standard deviation changed by a factor of the square root of n. And it's in your denominator, and that's kind of the picture of it. Um, if the sample size is no more than 30, it's considered small. Uh, the original population has a normal distribution, then the sample means, oh, and the original population has a normal distribution, and the sample means have a distribution that can be normal. In other words, if you have a small sample, but the original distribution was normal, yes, the central limit theorem applies. Now, here's an exception here. If the sample size is small, no more than 30, and the original population is not normal, then the central limit theorem does not apply. So there is some assumptions here for small samples. So this here, to kind of express this to you guys today, if I can get the right color, this is, this is for small samples, right? Small samples. So all the central limit theorem is saying is essentially any sample size bigger than 30, it doesn't matter what the original distribution is, the sample uh, distribution of the means will be normal. And it will have this, this mean and this standard deviation. All right, good, great. If it's small, but the original distribution was normal, it'll still apply. If it's small, but the original distribution is not normal, then the central limit theorem does not apply. Um, anyway, just kind of let you guys know. Give you guys some definitions, right? Um, these things are known as statistics. Now you might say, what are they? Right? The course is called statistics. So what in the world is this? Well, those, those are the measures that come from a sample. Okay? They're measures that come from a sample. Sample mean, sample proportion, well, that's probability, percent. S squared, that's going to be your uh, variance, and S is your standard deviation. But they come from a population, and there's some things called true values. So these are the true values that come from a population. And we'll go through this in more detail. Mu, P, sigma squared, and sigma. Those are population parameters known as true values if you were to take a census. So, okay, taking a census, fine, good. So let's actually take a look at this central limit theorem, um, but this is essentially the foundation of what we'll be doing today, although the central limit theorem itself has some fundamental applications. See, this is the basis of what we call estimation and hypothesis testing. It's the basis of it. This is why you want to go through and talk about it. Simulation. Um, practical use of the central limit theorem. Well, okay, there are some practical uses of this theorem. Um, when working with the mean from a sample, all right, when working with the mean from a sample, verify that the normal distribution can be used by confirming that the original population has a normal distribution or the sample size is at least 30. So in other words, you want the original population to be normal or at least have a sample size at least 30, then the central limit theorem applies. Working with a mean from a standard uh, group of values, uh, Z, this is your Z value formula. If you guys remember, this is the Z value. Now, um, standard distribution, standard normal distribution. 
Uh, a lot of this has changed because we're using the TI, just to let you guys know. Um, in the past, you definitely would use a Z table and you would use this in your working with a normal distribution. But I'm going to share with you guys how we change that from you just using with a TI, you know. And then I want to give you guys a definition we're going to see in the future. You know, this is, again, foundational theory here. If under given assumption we observe the probability of a particular event is exceptionally small, we conclude that the original assumption is probably not correct. What, is, what, is, what does small mean? Well, that's going to be defined for us. We already know not likely means less than 5%. Is that right? So not likely is less than 5%. So all they're saying here is there's something called a rare event rule. If under a given assumption, you already made an assumption, we observe the probability of an event is small, we conclude the original assumption is wrong. All right. Central error theorem and the concept of rare event is the basis for hypothesis testing in future topics in the study of statistics. So this is kind of, again, a foundational idea that I want to give this to people. Um, anyway, I, I'm not going to go through these notes again other than what I did here was verify this formula for people. That's all I did because, you know, We've seen these values in the simulation. I'm just verifying that that's for your new normal distribution, that that was the standard deviation. And I'm just verifying really for the simulation, the central limit theorem. So all of this is verifying the central limit theorem values from mu. You see, it's 3.5 to begin with. Here's the original standard deviation. And then I'm comparing these two, you know. Um, because this is how this is what you get when you take that 1.734 divided by the square root of 100. So now I'm verifying that those values are actually valid. Now this is all done through simulation. I just want to remark that the theory behind all this without simulation exists, but you got to take a lot more math courses, pay a lot more fees to derive this without simulation. Um and, you know, that was a statistics course I took. So people who major in math get to do prove all these formulas. And that's what I had to do, prove it. So everything that you've seen here, I had to prove, but you have to use a lot more advanced mathematics to do it. Here, we just simulate it and verify it, like if we're scientists, you know. Um, that's all. So all of these facts that you see here, these formulas, I had to prove, and they're proven. They're very elegantly proven. It's written in stone. Um, but we're just simulating these facts, just verifying it. So that's all I did with the rest of this stuff in the central limit theorem, is just verify this. Okay? Now, I think I went back to give an application of this rare event. Right? So remember that rare event rule we talked about? Um, here's a good example of it. You know, what's the, you guys know that it was widely believed that the human body temperature is really 98, is 98.6 degrees. Does anybody ever hear about that or think about that before in your life? 98.6 degrees is your body temperature. Now, I don't, I don't know the history of where that, where that came from or why. Don't know. But you can show that that's really wrong. You say, what do you mean you can show that? By what I just gave you guys, this rare event rule application of the central limit theorem. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. Here's the assumption. We're assuming that the mean body temperature is 98.6, but you know what researchers did? They went out, you had to gather a sample of 200 body temperatures, and you obtained a mean of 98.2 degrees. That's the mean. And then what was the standard deviation? 0.62. So this is gathered data. If we assume the human body temperature is 98.6, what's the probability a sample of size, and I think I'm going to have to change this. Typo. Typo. Sorry about that. Researchers gathered 100 body temperatures. Standard deviation is 0.62. Assume the body temperature is 98.6. What's the probability a sample 
of size 100 will be no more than 98.2. In other words, we know the distribution is normal. So what we get to do now is this. Remember this. This is our, our mean for the sample distribution of the means. This is the standard deviation for the sample distribution of the means. Okay? So we take that sigma of 0.62. I know it came from a sample. It should be S technically, but, you know, it came from a sample. It's not realistic. Divide by the square root of N, so we get 0 0.062 for our new sample distribution. So we're going to try to find the probability now, ladies and gentlemen, that the body temperature would be no more than 98.6. That's what we're trying to find. You guys have a lot of experience with the normal distribution. So, of course, in the TI, you say, what do you do? Well, I went through this, sorry, probability of 98. Ninety-eight point two. They want to know what's the probability that you have a body temperature of ninety-eight point two if you assumed the mean was ninety-eight point six. I apologize. So you're saying, what's the chance that I get that value? Well, we can compute that. The probability that the body temperature is no more than ninety-eight point two is very small. Okay, and we did the normal CDF. Remember the lower value, 98.2, 98.6 was the mean, 0.62 is a standard deviation. So, you know, that's that's how many, that's that's 10 zeros in front of the number. So this is the demonstration of the rare event rule, that the probability that a sample of 100 people would have that body temperature given that you know, and I shouldn't say the phrase given that because it's not a conditional probability, but based on the assumption it's 98.6, it's a very small probability that 100 data values would give would be no more than 98.6. Very small. So what that means is your original assumption is incorrect. Now, this is a, a very good tool. It's an informal tool. We, we formalize this really, ladies and gentlemen, in a hypothesis testing question, it's a little more formal, but this is an illustration of the central limit theorem and the foundation of what I'm talking about, um, hypothesis testing. So this is an example of the rare event rule. Anybody remember p-value stuff? Maybe from high school you took this course? Uh, that's what they're talking about, so you guys know. Uh, anyway, let's take a look at some more interesting things, okay? So here's some applications of the what? Central limit theorem. A direct application um, of it. So I'm going to say to you guys this. The life expectancy in the United States is 78.9 degrees, according uh, 78.9 years. Okay, life expectancy is normal um, from the CDC in 2014. However, different ethnicities have different life expectancy rates. I believe I got this information from the CDC. Okay, and this is in 2014. So just to let you guys know that this data changes all the time. The cause of death also varies from ethnicity to ethnicity and by state even. And I think these links, I, in fact, I know these links, takes you to some websites where you can find some good information on life expectancy. But you guys know on average, Native Americans live an average of what? 75.06 years. Okay, what about African Americans? Now, this is in general. This is through in the United States. This is even by state. African Americans live 75.54 years. Uh, white Americans live 79.182 years. Hispanics live what? 82.89 years. Asians live 86.67 years in the U.S. Okay, now this is according to CDC based on 2014 data. This changes based on what? On, on uh, well, this is just this data changes. We will use central limit theorem to determine the probabilities a group of individuals, now probably a group of people from the same population, using this information of worldwide life expectancies. If lack of ex if life expectancy of all races in the U.S. is normally distributed with a mean of seventy point eight years and a standard deviation, uh, here's the thing. 
I had to get, make an assumption. I think the assumption is really a bad assumption, in all honesty. I don't think the standard deviation is about 15.9 years. It's probably closer to 10. So anyway, just to let you guys know, it's just an exercise. And I did say this was an assumption. So all I did was for this for people, okay? Since you guys know about the what? The normal distribution. We're just saying here, this first question, what is it? What's the probability that five randomly selected people living at least 90, 90 years? So what's the probability 10 randomly selected people living less than 60? What's the probability of 20 randomly selected people living between 60 and 90? So in other words, we're talking about now taking the probability of a group of people. Okay? Not a single person, but what? A group. Okay? And we already know how to do this, but this time what? For the first question... How many people? Five. Okay, this is your N. And you say, what's the probability they live at least 90? Okay, P, remember how we do at least 90? Isn't that greater than or equal to 90? All right, you guys with me on this here? So these are all groups of people. Um, so here's my first question. So this is life expectancy of all races in the U.S. What was the mean for all races? It's right up here. So this part is not an assumption. I got this from the CDC, 78.9. And then what's the standard deviation? Well, this was made up, and I apologize because I think it's Oh, it's back down here, 15.9. Okay. So you might say, how do I put all this together in such a way to answer the question? Well, central limit theorem says what? Okay. Your mean now is going to be this. It's really the mean of the sample distribution is mu. Standard deviation, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be what? Sigma over the square root of the sample size. Okay. This is using this. This is using the central limit theorem to now answer probability questions or percent questions um, based on a group of people. So let me share with you guys how you can do this in the TI. Right. So you guys already know. Now, should you draw a picture of the question? Yes. Yes, you should. So should we draw a picture? Do you guys know at least 90? Or do you guys are you guys uh are you guys really good with this? Right? So if I go now here, second distribution, normal CDF. This is at least 90. For at least at least 90, what's the lower value? Huh? At least 90. That's 90 or more. So is it 90? Okay, good. What's the upper value? 9999. Nine, nine, nine. What's my new mean? Oh, the mean was what? 78 point what? 9. Now take 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 a close look. I'm entering, I'm using this information. Okay. So I'm using this is my mean. And this is a standard deviation, but don't forget the sample size here is what? Five. They took five individuals. This is a group of people. So in the TI now, what would we put? We would put the standard deviation of what? 15. Uh, where are you? 15.9 divided by, I can do this, the square root of what number? Five, okay? That's my new standard deviation for what? The group of five people. Uh, it's 5.9. Let's go back. I thought I put 15, so let's go back. 15.9 divided by what? Square root of five. 
So ladies and gentlemen, this is the only thing you change when you have a group of people. So if you have 10 people, what would you do? 10. If you had 20, what would you do? 20. That's a square root. And now, ladies and gentlemen, since you guys had a test on this, what is this going to be? Yeah. So here's what I'm going to write down. I got to write it down somewhere. Let's write it down. Uh, approximate this to the nearest thousands here, okay? So for question number one, probability somebody lives the group. The group of individuals live what? At least 90? Zero point zero was it five nine? All right, zero point zero five nine for question number one. So it lets you guys know how to do that. Okay. So this is really using the central limit theorem. This is a group of five. So it's almost like if I randomly select five people in this room, the chance you live to at least ninety is a point zero all five people is is uh, is about almost a six percent chance. Okay, if I pick. If I pick any, if I said, okay, can any five people stand? The chance you guys live at least to 90 years is about a 6% chance. I mean, the group of five, all of those five, not individually. All right, we're going to use some of this stuff in the future. Now, look at question number two. What does question two say? We're going to now select how many people? 10 people. So I'm going to select 10 people now. I'm going to ask that 10 people. I wish, really wish I could get used to this change. I'm going to select 10 people now of, out of this room. What's the probability they live less than 60 years? I really. So the chance that all 10 will live what? Less than 60, as opposed to at least 90. Less than 60. So, so number two, question two now, is this. What's the probability all 10 people will live less than what? 60 years. Okay, that's for the group of 10. Question number two. So, okay, go to the TI now. And now remember, I'm going to do this. Second distribution, less than 60. Do you guys remember how to do that? Don't you need minus what? 9999, the lower value. And then you need what? 60 here. It's the same mean, same standard deviation. But what do you do now? Change this, change this to what? 10. This is a group of 10 people. This is the probability all 10 live less than 60. Ah, what is this? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, if they said to approximate to the thousands, what would that be? Yes, is that, isn't that smaller than 5%, by the way? So you say, what does that mean? It's not likely because this is now a group of 10. This was a group of five. So it's not likely if I select 10 people, all 10 will live, what, less than 60 years of age. It's not likely to happen. You guys see what, what I'm saying here with the central limit theorem and these probability? It's a very simple thing. You now have a group, and you're just changing your standard deviation for the normal distribution by taking the, 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 the original distribution standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. What about a group of 35? Now, this is going to be an interesting thing because when you start getting large groups, things get a little sensitive. Um, a group of 35, this has to now apply to all 35 people. And you go, well, what does that mean, all 35? Okay. If you take 35 people at random, what's the probability all 35 live more than 100? Oh, my God. I'm... More than 100 years? All 35? So let's say we have 35 people in the room. What they're asking is what's the chance that all 35 people live more than what? 100. Okay? All 35 
So you go, okay, well, how do I do that? Well, let's get the right color, by the way. Three, probability greater than 100. And how many people? 35. So if we have 35 people in the room, I'm going to try to compute the chance you guys live to what? More than 100. All of you. All of you. Okay? What do you guys think that's going to be? I'm going to say to you guys, I'm going to go out on a limb. It's probably close to zero. Why? What's the mean? The mean is not even close to 100. Standard deviation was about 15 years. It's actually closer to 10. But whatever, it might even be nine or eight. Um, okay, whatever. But let's see what that means here, okay? Second distribution, normal CDF. Um, more than 100, that means the lower value has to be what? 100. What's the upper value? 9999, do I have it right? Now, same mean, same standard deviation, but we have to divide by the square root of the sample size. And that's going to be what number here? 100 now. Oh, no, not 100, 35. Okay. Okay, close that here. And, and you guys can't see at home. Here's what I'm doing here, okay? So we entered the lower value of 100 because we have to see more than 100. Um, upper value is the default. 78.9 is mean. Standard deviation 50.9 divided by 35. And ladies and gentlemen, what's the deal? Yeah, that's even rarer. It's even rarer. That's about 14 zeros before a two. So if I have to approximate to the nearest thousands, what do you think this gives me? Yeah, and that's pretty much smaller than what? 5%. So again, it isn't likely if everybody in the room was chosen that everybody would live more than 100 years at group. So you're referring to now a group of people as opposed to an individual. That's what that central limit theorem is, is saying here. That's one of the applications. So, you know, I, I went through some of these things here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, I hope I changed them appropriately. I did. I did. You know what I did was I started to try to use chat GTP or whatever that is. Did I say it backwards? Is it G? GPT. And I, I want chat to give me the mean and standard deviation, right? Um, I got this from a website based on data from 2014. I think chat G whatever. It gives you like something like data from 2018. And then it doesn't even have all the complete data. It doesn't always have the standard, it doesn't have the standard deviation. Because I've been asking. Give me the standard, finding standard deviations, it's very difficult with data. Finding means online is easy. Everybody keeps track of means, but they don't keep track of the standard deviation, or at least they don't report it. And that bothers me, because we need it. We need standard deviation just as much as the mean. So it's not so easy to get. So that's why writing some of this stuff can be hard to do. And sometimes chat has the information, sometimes it doesn't. So, it, and then sometimes it says random thing, not random, but they say, hi, the standard deviation is somewhere between like eight and nine or eight and 10, you know? So the best chat can do is even give you a, a guess because people, I guess people just don't report that measure as much as they report the mean, which I think is not good. I think the standard should be both personally. You should be given both the pieces of information Always the consistency and the what in the center. So what I did was, again, it's not that I'm bored, but and my wife says, when are you going to publish your book? I think she wants to spend the money. She didn't think she wants a new refrigerator, a new what? Oh, I shouldn't tell you guys. She wants new things, new refrigerator. She wants a new stove. You know how expensive stoves can be? Holy shit. You know what I said? But you don't even cook. I'm the one that cooks, so I'm fine with the old stove. I'm the cook. 
She doesn't cook. I cook. Is that a good answer? It's scary? What's scary about that answer? Does she react? <laughs> What's offensive about it? I'm trying to think of it. I can't, I can't, without my coffee, I can't really think. Um, is that an offensive thing to say? If you say, but I'm the one that cooks and I'm okay with the stove. I, I don't see that. Is that offensive, you guys? No? What do you guys think? Is that horrible? Is that mean? I don't know. If, okay, if I said to her, What? You need new shoes. I don't know. Maybe that's not even a good analogy. Like I said, I haven't had my coffee. Well, I I, I have to get a new stove, but I don't I don't want to. But I have to. Why? Because it has to match the new refrigerator. And the new refrigerator has to match the new what? Cupboards. And the new cupboards have to match the new floor. That's how it works. It's not about, ladies and gentlemen, needing a new stove. It's about matching. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Is that kind of mean? Is that, oh, yeah. so, how I get along? I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's logical. Anyway, where am I at? Okay, what am I trying to show you guys? What does it have to do with the stove? See, I need my coffee. Uh, what am I showing to you guys? Oh, yeah, here's the deal. I did, you see all those questions on those notes. I turned it into a, like a homework worksheet question thing. So give you guys some more practice of this. And um, I even put the what? So it's, oh, yeah, that's what it is. So she sees me working on this stuff and... <sighs> And I think I said, you know, there's enough here for a whole book. <sighs> so maybe that's how I'm going to become a billionaire. I'll sell the book. And that's when she gets her new what? Stove. Is that, does, does that sound mean? If I said, okay, I'll, I'll get you a new stove if I sell my book. And it'll match the refrigerator. Anyway, I drew a picture of the question, like I told you guys. See that first question we did? Remember the first one we did? I drew the, drew the bell, um, gave you the instructions there, and oh, same answer. Look at that, 0 0.059. Okay, solutions again. Oh, N is 10, but the question is different, less than 60. There's a picture of the bell, the mean 78.86. Showed you guys again. Oh, and then I said it was not likely, approximately zero. Drew a picture of the question. Uh, what is that? Number three? Did I change it? Oh, I use I skipped number three. Okay, whatever. See, I told you I need my coffee. Um, whatever this one. Oh, this is between sixty and ninety. Okay. Uh, you guys see? Isn't that kind of a nice bell? I don't know about you guys. I think that bell's beautiful. And there you go. I guess I skipped this one. This was this is almost this is close to one. So take a look at this question here. By we, this is what I'm saying with this question, right? Um, now you're selecting 20 randomly people. What's the probability you select 20 people and they all live between 60 and 90, right? They all live. Uh, this is all by the central limit theorem. That's almost certain they're going to live between what, 60 and 90? If you select people, if you select 20 people, almost certain. So if I said, please, 20 people stand up, you, it's almost certain you're going to live between 60 and 90. That's a good thing. Finally, we get a good answer. Uh, if we select 35, it's probably they, they live more than 100. I can't even, you could barely see the 100. You guys know it's, it's not good. So if this class is a class size of 35, chance everybody lives more than 100 is not likely to happen. Sorry. Sorry, class of 35. Change, change the class size to 50. 
Probability they live between 60 and 70. I did the solutions already for you guys here. Uh, there you go. And that's really not likely. How many people we're, we're, doing, we're talking now? 50. So if I have a class size of 50, the chance that, that they all live between 60 and 70 is not likely to happen either. Anyway. And then I changed the ethnicity. And ah, standard deviation is still 15.9. This is an assumption. I don't like that personally, but whatever. So I changed some on you guys. And, and please forgive me, like for this question, no more than 65. I, if I had, I might do it all over again and change the picture. I got to see if uh, Desmos, I did it in Desmos. I got to see if Desmos can get me a nice tail where I can see the 65 or less. But you can't see it in this picture. So for some of the pictures, I just want to remark, you can't see it. All right, this one you can see. So I changed it. 10 randomly selected people probably live more than 90 right here. So you guys have the solutions to it as well. All right. So central limit theorem is a very powerful foundation.